If you go on Amazon and you look for self-help book, there's a half a million different self-help books out there right now. Some of the titles that got my attention, Get Out of Your Head, Get Out of Your Own Way, Getting Past Your Past. And I love the title, Good Vibes, Good Life, because the subtitle says, How Self-Love is the Key to Unlocking Your Greatness. Let me tell you something about self-help books. They are all basically the same thing. They tell you that the answer is within you. All self-help books come back and they either point to self-discipline or self-care or self-love that this whole idea, it has to be all about you. God had a different way of going about this. God said, if, if you will rely on me, I can do amazing things in your life, but you have to put your trust in me. The answer is not found within you. God says the answer is found within me. And that's why we have statements like, the Lord is my shepherd. That is a reminder as you begin your day that you are not the shepherd. You're not the one calling the shots. You're not the one responsible for getting yourself through this world but that you have a shepherd who is doing that for you. In fact, when God was addressing the brokenness of Israel, I mean, they were just a broken, hurting, deeply wounded people. God came at them from Ezekiel 36 and said this, I, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you that heart of stone there is a surgery that's taking place right now in our lives there's a surgery in my own spiritual walk there's a surgery that i sense is going on in america right now i believe that god is removing some things so that he can bring in some things god is in the process of restoring a lot of hurt and he's willing to restore some hurt in you today too oh my goodness my covid project this year uh, was to rebuild my deck. I got rid of all the, the uh, treated lumber, went with composite, you know, trying to make it all nice. My grandkids kept getting splinters from the old stuff, so let's go with stuff they won't get splinters from, and now they can run on that deck. But doggone it, in, if, in rebuilding that deck, if I didn't smash my thumb, I mean, I'm telling you, that thing throbbed for days. I had to constantly protect it. It was constantly reminding me that I didn't have access to that thumb anymore. Do you know how much you need a thumb? You, you just don't realize it until, until you've struck it so hard, it's now incapacitated. It, as some people say, you win thumb, you lose thumb. Oh, come on, that's gold. Are you kidding me? That's all I got from that? As a community, sometimes, I, I think it feels like we've been hit by a hammer. 2020 has been an absolute painful hammer in our life. This is far from our favorite year. We just want this year to go away. In fact, now we put so much hope on 2021, I'm not even sure 2021 is going to hold up to that much stress. And December 27th is the last Sunday of this year, and I'm I'm seriously thinking about having a eulogy for 2020. Let's bury that thing so we can move on. Yeah, yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? We are hurt, and we are injured, and we are angry, and we are depressed, and the anxiety is growing in our life. Thank goodness, Brandon, he's going to do that Wednesday night class on how to get through anxiety, but we're feeling this right now. And the answer to this is not some self-help book from Amazon. The answer is found in God's Word. And if you will draw close to Psalm 23, you can begin each day of your life with that tender little statement of, the Lord is my shepherd today. I'm not my own shepherd. He is. And he's got this, and he's got me. We've been approaching Psalm 23 for all of our newcomers, not verse by verse, but by themes. We've talked about a shepherd who leads and a shepherd who feeds. We've talked about a shepherd who protects and a shepherd who corrects. And then we just have two themes left, a shepherd who restores 
and a shepherd who rewards. Today I want to talk about the restoration of the shepherd. Tucked inside Psalm 23 are two statements that have to do with restoration. They have to do with refreshing us. One is, uh, he anoints my head with oil, and the other one is, he restores my soul. Let's talk first of all about this statement, you anoint my head with oil. There's lots of different views on this statement. Uh, Some believe that this is a connection to David's anointing as king. When, When he was anointed and set apart from everyone else in Israel. If you don't know the story, uh, Jesse had several sons. Uh, The prophet Samuel comes, and he's there to anoint the next king of Israel. They had a king at that point, King Saul, but he was there to move on. We are moving on now. And he tells Jesse, one of your sons will be the next king of Israel. And so Jesse starts bringing out his sons, and he brings out that, that firstborn, and he was amazing He was smart, Uh, he was personable, he was tall and dark, a lot like your preacher. And just, uh, everybody loved this guy. And Samuel at first thought, this has got to be the next king of Israel. And God said, no, that's not my choice. And so then Samuel moved to the second son. No, that's not my choice. Third son, that's not my choice. Fourth son, he keeps going all the way down the line until he runs out of boys. And Samuel looks at Jesse and he says, do you have any other sons? And that's when Jesse says, well, yeah, there's, there's the runt of the family. He's a shepherd. He's out with the sheep right now. And Samuel says, bring him in. And in came young David. And the minute Samuel saw David, he knew this is God's choice. And on that day, in front of all those other brothers, that old prophet anointed David king. Now it would be several years before he actually took the throne, but that was the day he was anointed. And there's a lot of people, as they read through Psalm 23, they connect that, you anoint my head with oil as the, se- as the setting apart of King David. I don't think that's what's going on here. Some see it in regards to the shepherd, uh, the sheep. Sheep would, sheep would injure their head a lot. Uh, Sheep would butt heads with other sheep. That would hurt. They would cut their snout on sharp rocks. That would hurt. They'd sometimes stick their head into thistles, uh, trying to get through grass. They're not very smart, so trying to get to the green grass, they'd go right through thorns, and they'd cut their heads. And so uh, a kind shepherd back then would often apply oil to the head of the sheep. And because this whole thing starts with uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, maybe this is about our hurts and pains. He anoints my head with oil. It's about addressing the hurt in my life. Maybe, but I don't think think that's it either. And here's why, just so you know. There's a progression in Psalm 23. You gotta be able to track with it. We start as a shepherd. We start in the the, uh, meadows. We start in the high country. We go through the valley. But then we end up in a dwelling. We end up in a tent with the shepherd. Inside that dwelling place is a a table. Uh, There's a cup that's overflowing. And it's inside that part of the story where that phrase, you anoint my head with oil. The last progression, by the way, just so you have it, is where we'll be next week. It leads to a house that we'll have in heaven for all eternity, forever and ever. Beautiful progression inside Psalm 23. But where this phrase, you anoint my head with oil, is found is inside the dwelling. The Lord who was my shepherd has now become my host. And he has invited me to his table. And he has overflowed my cup. Remember that from a couple weeks ago for for the newcomers real quick. If the king took a pitcher of wine and overflowed your cup, literally overflowed it to where it spilled on the table, it meant that you had special favor with him. If at any point the king allowed your cup to get empty, it meant the evening was over, it's late, the king is tired, it's probably time for you to leave. But if he just kept overflowing your cup, it meant he wanted you to stay there more and more and more. And our our host has overflowed our cup because he wants to be with us. It's in that part of the passage, the psalmist says, you anoint my head with oil. So here it is. Here's what would happen in ancient times. If you were invited uh, to someone's house and, and the host wanted to show you 
special honor. The host wanted to show you a special, a special dignity, bestow a special dignity on you. There was a protocol as to what would happen. You'd step into the house. First thing that you, would happen is you'd be greeted with a kiss, a kiss on both cheeks. You know, just we're so glad you're here, and there'd be this, this kiss. And then you'd be asked to sit down, and a servant would come over and wash your feet. And then that servant would also anoint your head with oil. Uh, the, the oil anointing was refreshing. For, for any of us who have been in a hospital for a few days, you know after a few days of not getting a shower, not getting your hair washed, you know how you, that, that just affects your whole well-being. You know, you just don't, you just don't, you feel out of sync. Nothing feels right. And uh, just getting that shower after you haven't had one for a long time feels so refreshing. That's what that anointing of that oil would do in your head. It'd just be so refreshing. And then a rug would be rolled out. A table would be put on the rug. Very, very low table. Cushions all around it. You'd be invited to come to recline and you'd be given your first glass of wine. That's how you'd be welcome and know that you were being honored. Just so you know, in the life of Jesus, he's invited to a Pharisee's house named Simon. And Simon doesn't do any of that for Jesus. And in the middle of this dinner party, suddenly this woman uh, comes in. The Bible says a wicked woman. She came in, she found her way to Jesus. She collapses at his feet. She starts crying on his feet. She's kissing his feet. She's using her own hair to wipe his feet. She takes out this bottle of perfume. She anoints his feet uh, with this perfume. And through that whole time of this woman showing Jesus unbelievable honor, it's the Pharisee, Simon, who's sitting there thinking to himself, if Jesus were a real prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is. He wouldn't allow her to touch him. And when Jesus had finally had enough of that man, Jesus turns on him and he says, Simon, do you see this woman here? And then Jesus says this. He said, when I came into your house, you didn't give me a kiss. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. He says, and since this woman has been here, She's not stopped kissing my feet. She's not stopped washing my feet with her own tears. She hasn't stopped anointing my feet. I think that's what this phrase is all about. We have a shepherd who has been guiding us and leading us on every path we need to be at. And once in a while, we have to go through a dark valley. And some of us have been through some dark valleys, some dark valleys of death even. We've come through that. I will not fear that because you are with me. The psalmist says, but then we've moved into the house where the Lord is now our host and he has prepared a table. Our enemies are locked out. We are now eating with him. The cup is being overflowed to show our favor and he has anointed our head with oil. Unbelievable refreshing and restoration is happening right now. I don't know what hurt and pain you've been through. Uh, this whole last year feels out of sync. Everything is out of sync. If your heart is out of sync, by the way, that's called arrhythmia, that's not a good thing. You let that go on too long, that is not a healthy thing. You have to get that addressed. You have to go to a physician and get that fixed. Well, what physician are you going to go to? You anoint my head with oil, but then let's get to that second phrase. He restores my soul right now right now god is doing some restoration you may not feel it just yet but it's right here boy our souls you know just inside deep inside can't that get damaged don't you sense that a little bit that my soul has been damaged sometimes it's the circumstances of life that can do a lot of damage sometimes it's our poor decision we injure our own soul Uh, Sometimes somebody we love can hurt us and take a big chunk out of us. Sometimes it's even Satan trying to damage your soul. In Psalm 143, for the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. 
He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Can't you just sense the damage that's done there? What are you going to do when your heart is out of sync? What are you going to do when the damage is so intense? Who's going to restore you? Who's going to put us back together? Who's going to give it back to us what has been taken? The answer is the Lord will do that. We refer to him sometimes as blind Bartimaeus because that's the way he was. Blind Bartimaeus was sitting at the gate. He was a beggar. That's what his whole life was left to because he had lost his sight and he was a beggar now. And then he heard the great healer was there. He had heard that the great restorer of sight was nearby. Jesus is here. And blind Bartimaeus couldn't see Jesus, but he knew he was close. So he started crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. People around Bartimaeus tried to get him to be quiet. Shh, quiet. Don't blame. Don't, don't do that to the master. And blind Bartimaeus didn't listen to them. He cried out even more to Jesus. There's a whole world out there telling us right now, Jesus can't help us. Don't cry out to Jesus. Don't bother the master. They're wrong. They're dead wrong. And blind Bartimaeus just cried out even more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus finally turned his attention to Bartimaeus. He said, bring, bring that man here. They ran over. Bartimaeus, the master is asking for you. Get up. Get up. Come on. They walked him over, and now he's standing right in front of the great healer. And Jesus asked the craziest question. What, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> Did he not know what the answer was going to be? Bartimaeus says, I want my sight back. I want to see again. Jesus, with just a word, heals Bartimaeus. His eyes are open. His sight is restored. He immediately starts worshiping God. He immediately starts singing the praises of Jesus. The crowd immediately is amazed and shocked. If right now you were in front of Jesus, what could he restore for you? Today, he is the hope for our broken soul. He will restore my confidence. Jesus will restore my joy. Jesus will restore my love. Jesus will restore our credibility. Jesus can restore our possessions. Jesus will restore our dignity. Jesus will restore your honor. Jesus will restore your name. What is it that he can do for you today? What do you want me to do for you? What is it that you would love to have restored? It's all there. And it's promised in no other name but the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3. Repent therefore, turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And that times of, do you see the word there? Refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send the Christ Appoint it to you, that is Jesus Christ, whom heaven must receive until a time of restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This was going to happen, the restoration is coming, it's going to take place, all you have to do is just be patient. Poor Job, in the story of Job in the Old Testament, in chapter 1, he loses everything, everything. He waits for 42 chapters before we get to this verse right here. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than he blessed the first. The Lord blessed. Job gets it all back, by the way. Everything he loses in chapter 1, he gets back by chapter 42. But oh my goodness, 42 chapters of waiting for the Lord some of us are somewhere in the book of Job right now. Some of us are in chapter 42. We've seen what the Lord is able to restore. Some of us are in chapter 1 right now. We've just had some great loss in our life. Others of us are somewhere in between chapter 2 and 41. 
We're trying to find our way through this time of lostness. We know 42 is coming when we get it all back, but we're kind of in that moment of numbness and pain. He's going to restore. The restoration is coming. You just got to be patient and wait. It's coming. The question is, for us today, are we going to carry too much of this hurt? And that, that's something we all have a tendency to do, is just to carry too much. It's surprising that more of us don't know the story of the SS Sultana. Uh, the Sultana was the greatest maritime disaster in United States history. And that's what's surprising that more of us don't know this story. You think of a maritime disaster and you immediately think of the Titanic. That happened in 1912. This happened uh, in the late 1860s. The Sultana was a very, very large wooden uh, steam paddle boat that was running on the Mississippi. Uh, before its tragedy, it became responsible for, for carrying home all the Northern Union soldiers. The Civil War had just ended. Um, all of those prisons down south that were holding Union soldiers, all those soldiers were released. They all found their way to Mobile, Alabama, where they got inside the Sultana. Now, the Sultana was uh, commissioned with a capacity for 375 people. They put over 2,000 people on side. The Sultana was completely overloaded. Uh, it took off up the Mississippi what happened? What, what took place? Some, some people believe it was sabotage to get rid of all those Union soldiers, maybe. What we do know is that because of the overburdened uh, weight of all those people on there, they, they were shoved into room, standing room only. That that burden caused extra stress on that boiler, and in the middle of the night, that boiler blew. And after that boiler blew up, there was a fire. And after there was a fire, there were men trapped inside inner side rooms that could not escape. Those who did escape uh, found themselves inside the Mississippi River, in the Mississippi River water, which was frigid and moving fast at that time of the year. 1,800 people died that night. 1,800. 1,500 died on the Titanic. 1,800 died on the Sultana. And we don't really know that story very well. The bottom line to the whole thing, it was caring too much. This morning, some of us are caring too much. We're carrying too much hurt. We're carrying too much disappointment. Jesus is right here in front of us and if he asked you what do you want of me I want my joy back I want life back I want my happiness back I want my laughter back what do you want back Psalm 23 is the answer today not some self help book but Psalm 23 and you clearly saying today the Lord is my shepherd he's got this father in heaven for a whole bunch of us who have heart arrhythmia right now our, our hearts are just out of sync we're injured we're hurt bruised we've come to the only place we know to come and that is to the great physician the restorer of sight, the one who restores uh, hearing and blindness and restores lameness and our ability to move, the one who restores joy, the one who restores laughter, the one who restores our soul. We come to you. We're asking you for a miracle today, Father. In the name of Jesus, we're asking you to give us back that which we've lost so today today i'm just not going to carry this this is too much to carry it's just too much and so i'm going to give it to you and so in all of our hearts today we say to ourselves the lord is my shepherd he's got this i don't have to carry it